So today's Mother's Day, so we'll be in Acts chapter 17. Uh, That's a joke for our church because we are preaching through books of the Bible. This is what we do. We like to walk through books of the Bible verse by verse. And uh, and today we're gonna we're gonna continue in the in the book of of Acts. What we do here every Sunday is pretty simple as a church family. We we want to read the text, we want to explore the text, and we want to apply the text. We want to know what does the Word of God say. And what does it mean by what it's saying? And what are we supposed to do in light of what it means? And uh, and so we uh, are in Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to start by reading the text. We'll be in verses 16 through, uh, through through 21 today. It says this. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the Aragopas uh, I always say that wrong. I said it wrong in the first service too. Uh, Eropagus is how you pronounce it. I have a little bit of dyslexia. Forgive me. Saying, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring, for you bring some strange things to our ears, which we, which uh, we wish to know. Therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians. And the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So let's walk through this text. Here's what I want to do is we want to say, all right, what's going on uh, in this text? And then we want to do some application here on the back end. And so you got Paul here, verse 16. Now, while Paul's waiting for them in Athens. Okay, so you remember, he's waiting for Paul and he's waiting, or he's waiting for Timothy and he's waiting for Silas. He was just with the Bereans. Um, he had gone to Thessalonica and then he was with the Bereans. They ran him out. He went over to Athens, but, uh, but his companions stayed. And so he sent word to have them meet him. So here he is, he's in Athens and he's waiting for uh, for them. And Athens is the cultural center of Greece. And so this is what we need to know. That it's been the it has been for hundreds of years the home to some of the greatest philosophers the world had ever seen, like Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, Epicurus and Zeno, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, them today. It was also the center of religion in Greece. And so basically every God known to man could be worshiped there in Athens. Much like our nation, it was kind of a melting pot, a collection of all kinds of worldviews and beliefs and ideas. And so Paul's there, he's waiting, and as he's looking around, he's seeing these beautiful structures that are built to worship these gods, these false gods, and these idols. He's walking down the marketplace, and literally the streets are, are lined with idols to be bought and to be worshipped. And it says that his spirit was provoked within him. That is, he was stimulated, he was spurred on into anger, a type of righteous anger because of the idols that were there and that were being worshipped. Now, it's important to know, though, that this, that this spurring on in his spirit is not some mere, like, Paul's own spirit, but we know that the spirit of, li- uh, the spirit of Christ lives within those who believe. And so you have the Holy Spirit of God working in the spirit of Paul to spur him on to anger because of the idols that are being worshipped. And so he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So he goes first, as usual, to the synagogues, and he reasons there. But then during the week, he's in the marketplaces. He's where the people are, and he's conversing with them. He's speaking to all who would listen to him about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is always the centerpiece of his message, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so verse 18, some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So let's stop and let's understand these guys a little bit. Um, And so you have the Epicureans uh, who was founded by a guy named, catch this, Epicurus. 
And he lived in 341 uh, to 270 BC. So some few hundred years before this time. They're basically materialists. They, uh, they believe everything kind of comes from particles and matter. And then when you die, you just basically disintegrate kind of back into all things. There's no afterlife. They didn't really necessarily deny the existence of gods, uh, but the, basically these gods, if they exist, they didn't really have anything to do with humans uh, or our, our reality. And the chief aim ultimately for an Epicurean was to, uh, was to avoid pain. It was to avoid anxiety. It was to pursue happiness. And this was primarily done through friendships and uh, working, uh, working in ways that you... Uh, they brought value to others in areas that you really liked and enjoyed. So the, kind of the pursuit of materialism and wealth and, and stature, you kind of give that up to do something that you love that serves other people. And then ultimately you, uh, you find calm, a, a type of zen, or they don't say zen, but calm in your mind. And so you go to a peaceful waterfall, that's, you're finding peace in the location. But they thought, well, you can find this peace in your mind no matter where you are. And those are the kinds of things that they, the Epicureans um, uh, pursued. So you have another group of philosophers here, the Stoics. And the Stoics were founded by, guess what? Zeno. Huh. So um, 495 to 430 is when he lived BC. So now you're talking about 500 years prior to this is when this philosophy, ph- philosophy started. And they're basically pantheists. In other words, what they believe is the universe is all kind of just one. The universe is God, and we, as a part of that universe, get to participate in being connected with all things in the universe. God's not over and above or separate. God is the universe of which we're a part of. And, um, and so they're very ethical. They valued virtue and tolerance and self, self-control, and they taught wisdom and temperance and justice and courage. And there was a divine principle that tied the universe all together, and that was the logos, or reason, and they thought that you could reach your fullest potential, your fullest connection, connectivity to the universe by uh, by reasoning together and by attaining some kind of key or higher knowledge, right? And so you've got the Epicureans, you've got the Stoics, these are the most prominent philosophies of this day here. And so they get Paul and they accuse him of being a babbler, which basically is like uh, kind of an amateur philosopher where he would like, they're accusing him of basically picking different philosophies and just trying to like put them together. It's like this guy doesn't know what he's, what he's actually talking about. But it's interesting because they accuse him of preaching foreign divinities, plural, foreign divinities, because he was preaching of Jesus and the resurrection. And it seems that maybe there was some confusion that when he was talking about uh, Jesus, uh, he was talking about, they believed he was talking about the God Jesus. And when he was talking about the re- resurrection, Anastasis, the resurrection was also a God. And so you got this God of Jesus and this God of resurrection. And they were kind of confused on what he was actually saying. And so verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to hear, therefore, what these things mean. And so, uh, Areopagus means uh, basically Hill of Mars, or Mars Hill, or Hill of Ares, actually, but... uh, um, uh, Mars Hill is basically the Roman form of the Greek of the Greek god uh, Ares and Mars, and basically on this hill is where they would they would try cases and they would um, they would have a council and they would uh, discuss. So it seemed to be more actually connected through criminal charges, uh, but it doesn't seem Paul's under any kind of criminal investigation. But they bring him there because this is a place where they would uh, put someone on trial. And Paul's going to preach the gospel to them, which is going to be next week uh, in, in how he interacts and how he communicates. They're saying, tell us this teaching, and he's going to tell it to them. And so next week, we'll spend our time there. But before we get there, Luke does something. It's interesting. As you walk through the scripture verse by verse, you pay attention to, uh, to clues. You realize this was written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through Luke. And you, you, so we have to ask the text question to notice things that happen. And there's something that happens here that I found very interesting. There's a transition that Luke tells us something about this people before they move on to the, before he moves on to the next scene. He says this, now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there, they would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. 
So he takes a step back from the situation and he gives the audience, he gives the reader uh, some kind of perspective on the type of people that are here in Athens. That the culture was made up of people who are rooted in basically nothing. They were constantly seeking some kind of new teaching, something new to enlighten them, something progressive, something that would move them into further knowledge. And so they're very curious about this. But we're told that it's also the foreigners who live there that do this. I found that to be curious because Luke could have just said, Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, could have just said, all the people in Athens do this. But instead he says, the Athenians and all the foreigners who live there. So not just those who were from Athens, but those who came from foreign nations also think and look and act like the culture that surrounds them. Our text today starts with foreigners and it ends with foreigners. It starts with Paul as a foreigner in Athens and it ends by saying the foreigners that live there think and look a certain way. You have those who've been conformed to be exactly like their culture and you have the one who has been transformed by God and is now engaging that culture with the truth. Do you see the juxtaposition that takes place here? In 1 Peter, we're told that we are sojourners and that we as Christians are exiles in this world. We're told in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship as followers of Jesus is in heaven and is actually not of this world. I've been very burdened, I've been very burdened by this this week as I've sat in this text, this idea of oh, we as God's people being foreigners in this place. Jesus sets up his expectation of us being foreigners here in John 17. He says this, John 17, 14 through 19, I have given them your word. He's praying to God. This is a high priestly prayer before Jesus is uh, killed on the cross and then ascending, ascend, resurrects and ascends into heaven. He says, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I cons consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. You see what Jesus does here is he, he's leaving his disciples behind to continue on the, uh, the, mi the mission of reconciliation to the world. God's mission of reconciliation, that he sends Jesus to die on the cross and to uh, be buried and then to be resurrected, defeating sin, defeating death for all who believe. And then he preaches this message of hope that he is the truth, he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to the Father to be connected to God except through him. And now he ascends and he sends his disciples forward to continue on bringing this message of hope to the world. And what does he say? I have given them your, world, your word so that while they remain here in this world, which is where I'm sending them, that they may be sanctified, made holy, made set apart by what? Your word. Your word is truth. And what does he pray that they're protected from? The evil one. So the situation is that we are meant to be foreigners, God's people, his ambassadors here in this world for the sake of this world. And so here's what I've just been so burdened with this week. This question, what kind of foreigners are we? At LifePoint Church, what kind of foreigners are we? The church across the nation, what kind of foreigners are we? Are we foreigners that have been sanctified, set apart, made holy by the truth of God's word in such a way that it has transformed us from the inside out, transformed us away from our culture to the extent that we're hated, even just disliked? And here Jesus says they will be hated. I was, um, it's summertime, so we're like, praise God. And um, we, we set up a little pool every summer for our kiddos to swim in. And we, you know, I'll, I'll jump in and swim with them. And I, um, let's just say, 
I am no pool boy, okay? I struggle to keep the water clean, all right? Last, last year, it's, a, it's in the past, okay? I got a new year, going to keep this water blue and crisp. And so far, I'm like 10 days in and looks great, okay? So I'm swimming with him yesterday, and um, I'm, like, I'm like admiring the crystal blue water. I'm like, look at this water. Look at this. Look at what I have made. And, um, but I'm like skimming the top a little bit just to get the, the, you know, the little bit of the debris off the top. And so I put some goggles on, and I go underwater, and I realize this pool is dirty, there's particles everywhere, and there's blades of grass, and there's leaves, and there's, there's pockets of hair on the bottom because I have girls, and they're like swimming, and their hair comes out everywhere. Good night. And so, um, and so I realized that like it looked blue and clean on the surface, but then I put my goggles on, and I go under, and I see, I see the reality of what lays underneath. See, we might point out, friends, that we still live in a Christian nation, right? Even though it's in decline, and we recognize that as believers, Pew Research did a study in 2007, 78% of our culture, of our, of, of our nation, identified themselves as Christians, whereas today it's about 63%. So some might look from the outside and say, you know, the water, we need to skim the top, but the water is still blue. But if we put on our goggles and we dive beneath the surface, beyond what just people identify themselves as, what we say that we are, and we actually look to the beliefs and the behavior, really the worldview by which uh, we live in the church and outside of the church. We see something drastically different. So just so you know, so what a worldview is, is um, it's the sum total of our beliefs about the world, the big picture that directs our daily decisions and actions. It's like, it's the collection of all the things that you truly believe in heart, not just in your mind, and, and that it affects how you behave and you respond. It's, it's our basic belief about all things. It drives our behavior. It's the lens by which we see the world and we process all of the information and that we behave and we respond to. And so in our culture, there's about seven dominant worldviews, seven dominant worldviews. Um, and worldviews sometimes is difficult to like define some of these are, but I want to walk through them just so that we are made aware as we look around and we say, what, it, what drives the culture? What is the worldview, the belief systems at core that drive our culture? And so number one, you have a biblical worldview. And basically that is that God is the creator and that we process, we process the world through the lens of the book, through the word of God, and, and that we are transformed by it. And so we, we believe that there is a creator and that he designed things and that he determines right and wrong, and, right? and that's the worldview that we live, at, live through. So there's a biblical worldview. You have secular humanism, which is basically atheistic in, in nature. Uh, and basically there's no God, everything's naturalistic, nature is all there is. Secular humanists, we see, they see themselves as undesigned acts Accidental beings that arose through evolution, and they possess, and possessing a unique at, or unique attributes uh, such as self awareness and moral agency, and basically the aim the uh, is self glorification and pursuit of happiness is is kind of the purpose there because there's really nothing beyond the li this life. Uh, then you have postmodernism, and some of these you try to define quickly, but it's kind of like nailing down Jello, right? Like it's if you if you get like with worldviews because they're often pretty eclectic, but postmodernism is typically characterized uh, by criticism. It, it criticizes long-held beliefs regarding objective reality and value systems and human nature and overarching meta-narratives and those kinds of things. And, this, and, um, and so what happened was you had modernism that came and it kind of rejected religion as the foundation or the starting point for things. And modernism says, well, we're going to start a new foundation of truth and belief apart from religion. And so they did that. Well, then postmodernism, after modernism not only rejects the religious aspect, but rejects the foundations of truth altogether. And so now you have uh, from this things like relativism and you get critical theory and you get all these things where you're really kind of just deconstructing everything, but also there's really nothing to actually build upon because there's no foundational truth. And so that's where you end up with, um, with no objective truth, no objective moral reality. It's all relative, relativism. So you get uh, what leads to beliefs like um, 
boys can say that they're girls and a, and a woman can say that they're a man and you end up with terminology like instead of woman, it's birthing people. And I'm just, I'm saying that because that's the worldview that those kinds of ideas come out of. That's the only reason I'm making the case. Things like Roe v. Wade, uh, that, that you know, we just saw uh, some stuff happen there and we're praising God for some of the movement that's there. But the, but the ideology and the reason why you end up with like a Roe v. Wade is because of this kind of moral relativism. Uh, and, and so there's no real ob, uh, objective truth. It's, it ch- can change from person to person. And so we see that a lot in our culture, obviously. So you have number four, m- uh, moral therapeutic Deism. Now tell me if any of this sounds familiar. So God exists, we, we agree with that, and, and created the world and watches over human life. But God doesn't need to necessarily be uh, particularly involved in one's life, except for when you have a problem or where you really need God. Like he doesn't really need to be involved unless you, you, you want him to. And he wants people to be good and nice and fair to each other. And basically the central goal in life is happiness. God desires your happiness and your happiness is good and feel good about yourself. And if you're a really good person, uh, if you're a good person, then when you die, you go to heaven. And that's basically moral therapeutic deism. It's a, it's, it's a watered down version of Christianity, which I would say is not actually Christianity. It's not a biblical worldview in general. So I'll, I'll zip through the other one. So you got nihil, uh, nihilism, which is basically a rejection of all religious and moral pr- uh, principles in the belief that life is basically meaningless. You got Marxism, which is mostly political and economic theory, but it plays out practically in things like communism. And then uh, you have Eastern mysticism or new age mysticism, uh, which is something that we actually see a lot as well in our culture, where basically it's kind of like pantheism. We're all kind of spiritual. We're all part of the the big universe, right? The big you, and uh, you can have enlightenment and connection through knowledge, and you can, you're a spiritual person at your core, and that can manifest itself in a number of ways. Um, But but ultimately, um, you know, there's kind of, we're just a big part of God, which is the universe, kind of like what we saw with um, um, with uh, some of the philosophers today. And so these are the, so these are the types of the seven dominant worldviews in our culture today. And the reason I highlight them is because this, look, as a, as a people, as God's people, if we are going to, uh, we need to know what we're winning people from if we are going to be winsome to them. Right? God has called us to be on mission for this world. And so we need to be aware of what surrounds us in, uh, in the prevailing, um, philosophies and worldviews. Colossians 2.8, Paul warns the church, he says this, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophies and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Paul's warning the church, he recognizes, he has been in uh, Athens in these places and he recognizes that there are opposing worldviews, there are opposing philosophies and deceitful teachings that would seek to take people astray. He says, do not be taken captive. And he tells the church in Rome, um, Romans uh, 12 two, he says, do not be conformed uh, or to be made like the, uh, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed, be made different by the renewal of your mind. And so we see that this juxtaposition is there, just like we saw in, G- in John 17 with Jesus saying, protect them by your word, sanctify them, protect them from the evil one. And uh, because ultimately he's sending us into the world. And so with that, I wonder, and I ask again the question, what kind of foreigners are we? George Barna uh, out of Arizona Christian University released a study last year in April about worldviews and showed that although the majority of people in our nation, 63% or so, um, identify themselves as Christians, only about 6% of adults have a biblical worldview. That's six out of 10 actually view the world and process information and make decisions, moral decisions and life decisions based on the foundation of the word of God. So which one though, then of these beliefs is the most dominant in our culture? We should know that. And here's the answer that the study indicated. The answer is that none of these. 
none of these views is actually the most dominant. Actually, out of these views, the one that is most widely held is the biblical worldview, about 6%. Secular humanism comes about 2%, and then it just goes down from there. So you think, well, what about the rest? What about the 88%? What's dominating our culture? Well, the study termed the most dominant worldview is called syncretism. Syncretism. Let me, let me show you what syncretism is. So in our culture, we have freedom of religion and freedom of speech, praise God. We have a varying eclectic view of worldviews. You've got some worldviews that just make you cry. You got some worldviews that are a little bit sour to the taste. Some like that. Uh, you got some that make you smell from your pores. You've got some that are just nutty. You've got some that are sweet sweet sounding, sweet tasting, but you eat too much of it, no bueno. And you got some that seem like a good idea, but the next morning you realize it was not. <laughs> you have all these together in our culture. And then you have syncretism. And syncretism is a blended belief of multiple of these worldviews. In other words, in other words, people's beliefs have been so shaped by multiple worldviews that it actually that you can't actually identify them as being totally Marxist or totally postmodern or totally secular humanist. It's a combination. And here's what's interesting: it actually doesn't matter if they are not compatible or if the recipe doesn't flow. You just believe what you want. You believe what makes sense. You believe what you feel is right. 88% of our culture have a blended worldview. And now you ask, well, how then is 63% of our culture still professing Christians? How do those numbers work and how do they add up? And the answer is simple. We're blending right in. We're believing what they believe. We're accepting things that are not true to be true. We have 6% of Christians, adults, that have a biblical world view because we are blending in with the culture. We are not being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are being conformed to the patterns of this world is what the research indicates. And by the way, I think that our own personal experience in the church and in our culture testify to this truth. James 1.27 says that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained or unpolluted from the world. The culture that we live in, we're immersed in it. It's all around us. As Christians, every conversation that we have, every book that we read, every article, every media source, every school we attend, every, every uh, song that we listen to, every show that we watch or movie that we allow our kids, that worldview is always being shaped and shared. We live in the midst of it. I was watching a movie this last weekend with my kids and uh, it passed the plugged in review test and uh, all of the things that you do to kind of guard the heart and the mind of your child. And as we're in the middle of watching it, it was Peter Rabbit too. You have, uh, you have a scene by which um, uh, uh, one of the rabbits says to Peter Rabbit, hey, your dad did steal these vegetables, but he did it to put food in your bellies. 
And it was just a subtle passing comment. But do you know what it was? It was a drip of moral relativism to say, hey, you know what? As long as it's for the right reason, you can do the wrong thing. And so we stopped and I said, hey guys, do you guys, do you know what happened? And seven, five, and three-year-old, my kids were like, oh, they had no idea. But my seven-year-old was picking up on it and we stopped and we talked about it. We talked about more relativism. We talked about what God says about right and wrong. We can't escape it. We are immersed in it. But just because we're immersed in it, we do not have to absorb it. Genesis 20. God gives the Ten Commandments. In verse 2 through 6, this is what he says. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I am The Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The first command from God to his people is, I am your God. You will have no other gods before me. You will worship nothing else beside me. God cares that he is worshiped. Paul is in Athens and he sees the idols all around and his spirit is provoked within him because of the idols that are being worshiped. And friends, we look around ourselves, even in our own lives, and we see idols being worshiped everywhere. The idol of self is being worshiped. The idol of careers is being worshiped. The idol of sports is being worshiped. The idol of education is being worshiped. The idol of freedom is being worshiped. The idol of political parties is being worshiped. The idol of money is being worshiped. The idol of retirement is being worshiped. The idol of happiness is being worshiped. All the while, people are being deceived by lies. They're being deceived by lies and they're not receiving the grace and the mercy and the love of God that comes through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and they are going to hell. Should we not be provoked in spirit? And not provoked in some pious disposition as though like somehow we've arrived and we are better. We are sinners saved by the grace of a good and merciful God. That is all we are. And because of that, our spirit should be provoked within us. That a God that is mighty, he is deserving of all worship and glory. He expects to be worshiped. Psalm 24, David writes, lift up your head, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord almighty. He is the king of glory. Should not our spirits be provoked within us for the glory of God A God who loves this broken and deceived world so much that he sent his son, Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life, and he is the means by which we get to the Father. He loves this broken and lost and sinful and wretched world so much that he sought to redeem this world at the cost of the blood of his only son. That whoever would believe in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Next week, we're going to see Paul engage in the preaching of the gospel on Mars Hill. And 
I love it because he's tactful and he's winsome, he's strategic and he's thoughtful. He's not a spiritual bull in a china shop. And so don't confuse passion for the glory of God to mean recklessness as we seek to engage our culture. It is important that the Christian foreigner have a deep zeal and passion for this glory to worship God alone as we are all in our own process of sanctification and being made holy. And a passion to reach the culture and 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 an anger towards idolatry and the things that God is angry about. Don't confuse those things as some kind of bold, pious, holier-than-thou disposition towards the ignorance of this world. And we get to see Paul engage in that. And I love where he starts next week in verse 24. God created everything. And so I'll end with asking the question again. What kind of foreigner are you? What kind of foreigners are we in this culture? Are we being conformed to the pattern of this world Or are you being transformed by the renewing of your mind? That by the power of God's Holy Spirit and through the authority of his word, we are able to see and process all things in life through his precious and powerful word. Are you willing to allow God to transform you in such a way? Are we willing to allow God to transform us in such a way. Let's pray. Father, I I praise you for this text that we got to see today. For the righteous anger that Paul has, and it seems this is not out of character for what we saw with Jesus being burdened. I pray we would all model Jesus in the way in which we live separate from our culture with a passion to engage our culture, that we would love those around us and that we would accept them though we disagree with them and that we would love them and that we would compassionately care for them and and seek to be winsome in our relationship to them and yet that we would be weeping over those who reject you, that we would be burdened in anger when we see uh, when we see these these idols receive your praise and your glory. Help us, Lord, to be like Jesus. Forgive us, Father, for the times and the places, every single day even, to where our heart worships something besides you. Where our mind takes delight in something more than it takes delight in you. We're asking for your help to renew our mind, and we know that you have helped us by your spirit and by your word, and so... Forgive us where we have fallen short and show us grace and mercy as we continue to move ahead. Help us to be a people that rightly understands how to be set apart in this culture. That those who are lost and deceived by lies might find the truth. The truth that would set them free in this life and for eternity. And that truth is Jesus found in the person of Jesus. Jesus Christ, who died and who resurrected and who sits in glory this moment. May we be a people honoring to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of every message, we take some time, just a few minutes, to reflect and respond, uh, thinking about the the words that were taught today, the word of God that we read today. And so as a worship team plays, I would just ask that you take a moment and ask God to help you. What are you believing that's a lie? Are you, what kind of foreigner are you? That you would repent and that you would ask him to help you, that he would help move you, all of us, to loving him and worshiping him, to being burdened for the people and the things of this world ultimately that we would reach them and be winsome in our relationship towards them 
that we would be balanced in the way in which we live out our Christian faith as foreigners, citizens of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And so take some time to pray. And at the end of the service, we'll have some people up here to pray with you. If you have anything you want to pray about, any, any needs, any issues, struggles, you just come and let us be a part of that with you. We would, we would love to, uh, to join you in that.